Good evening and welcome to Dig This. My guest this evening is Professor William G. Deaver from the University of Arizona and the Department of Near Eastern Studies. Professor Deaver is an eminent archaeologist who has worked in the Near East, in Israel especially, for over 30 years. And tonight, it's a pleasure to have him. Welcome. Thank you, Tom. Bill, you began your fieldwork career in Israel excavating a very famous biblical site of Tel Gezer. What made you pick that site to excavate? Actually, it was picked for me by my teachers and sponsors. Uh, not a bad choice, however. Uh, it's a very important Bronze and Iron Age site, centrally located, been excavated at the turn of the century rather badly. And it was an ideal place for young people to practice new methods. And so we wanted both to recover the actual history of the site by re-excavating it and uh, to experiment with new field methods and to try to help train and place a new generation of younger American archaeologists. Now, Gezer, uh, as you mentioned, was excavated at the turn of the century. And you received a great deal of funding from the Smithsonian Institution. Why start a dig at a site that had already been excavated? Well, first, because of its importance. Um, and despite its importance, it wasn't very well understood. Um, and in that particular era, as you probably remember, we thought we could learn more by re-excavating old sites than by digging into a virgin site that had never been touched. In other words, more information for less investment. So we planned a 10-year project. Um, and on the whole, I think we reached our uh, objectives. Nowadays, I, I might pick a smaller site and excavate a larger percentage of it, but to, to plop ourselves down at a big mound that was already well known um, seemed the right thing to do at the time. And there was sufficient money for it. We were sponsored mostly by uh, the Smithsonian Institution with American counterpart funds. Those were heady days in archaeology. Now, you, uh, you were a key player in the debates in the 1970s and the 80s about um, the role of anthropology and archaeology. How did, how did that work? Well, that was part of your rebellion, I guess, against, against our own training. Uh, my generation were all biblical archaeologists. We were trained as clergy persons. There were no clergy women in those days. Um, and um, uh, we dug at biblical sites with funding from biblical sponsors and that sort of thing. This was almost uh, the heyday of biblical archaeology. But I began to see that uh, the future did not lie in that direction, uh, and I became somewhat enamored with anthropological theory and with new, more scientific, analytical methods. And so Gezer was partly a deliberate experiment uh, in trying to move uh, biblical archaeology more in the direction of general archaeology. We were, we were young, and we thought everything was possible. And w was it successful, would you say? Uh, yes and no. Um, what I wanted to do was to make um, what I called Palestinian or civil palestinian archaeology an independent and professional discipline apart from uh, biblical and religious and theological studies. And I think we achieved that separation. But then I thought there, there would be a new dialogue between these two separate disciplines, and that really hasn't materialized. As you know, archaeology is so specialized today that um, archaeologists get bogged down in their own procedures, their own data. Uh, meanwhile, biblical studies has moved off in an entirely different, rather non-historical direction. And there isn't much dialogue. That's perhaps been the greatest disappointment of, of my career. I, I really hope to separate these two disciplines so as to have a dialogue rather than a monologue. And now we just have two separate disciplines. Well, you, uh, do, do you think uh, there, there's a future for a dialogue, or, or are the I boundaries hope so. really fixed? I hope fixed? so. Um, but I'm, I'm not as optimistic as I was when I was younger. A lot of uh, my younger colleagues and, and students, like yourself, and after all, you started a guess or two, and I'm very proud uh, to say that, um, have gone more in the direction of anthropology. Um, there are a few people who would like to see Palestinian archaeology or archaeology in the Holy Land go back more in the direction of biblical studies, but I think it's impossible. I think we've burned our bridges. I really think that uh, our little branch of Near Eastern archaeology will remain strongly anthropological or it will collapse. Um, one of the, uh, well, what do, you, what do you think about the future of the field? I mean, you, you've painted a rather bleak uh, <laughs> picture here. What do archaeologists know about the future? They're stuck in the past. Um, it would be risky to make any predictions about Middle Eastern archaeology because there are so many factors entirely out of our control, at least for us Americans. You know, the Middle East is very volatile. Uh, nationalism is on the rise everywhere and has a great impact on archaeology. Uh, in some cases, foreign excavators are virtually frozen out of the field. Um, American political 
policies make it difficult for us to excavate very much in the Arab countries. You've been very successful in excavating in both Israel and Jordan, but I think that's unique. Uh, the future is rather bleak for many reasons. There aren't many jobs uh, on the American academic scene. A lot of capable young people out there are not finding jobs. This is part of the general decline of interest in the humanities, I think. Most universities are very strongly in favor of science and technology. That's where the big bucks are. And archaeology has become a kind of luxury. Uh, many think that we can no longer afford it. Bill, you've, uh, in, throughout your career, you've been almost the bad boy of archaeology. I mean, you've been at the center of, of uh, controversy and so happened. on. <laughs> Pardon? Don't know how that happened. <laughs> I don't know. But um, most recently, uh, you've been drawn into the debate over the historicity right. of the Hebrew Bible, of the, the Old Testament. Right. What, what is your position on the historical depth of the, of, the, of the document? Well, there has grown up in Europe particularly a new school of biblical scholars, they call themselves revisionists, who think the uh, Hebrew Bible is a collection of fairy tales, basically. There's no history at all to be derived from it. I wouldn't go to that extreme. The Bible is obviously not history in the modern sense, doesn't purport to be. Um, but I think the Bible contains nonetheless a lot of historical information about the Iron Age of ancient Palestine or ancient Israel. And I try to read the Bible not as scripture, but as an archaeologist who writes history from things, uh, looking for some support from the texts. I take a kind of moderate position. I'm neither a minimalist nor a maximalist, uh, a skeptic or a credulist. Um, and I'm not interested in theological issues at all. I think that these issues have to be kept quite strictly separate from archaeology. Uh, I spent most of my adult life trying to keep nationalism and, and uh, theology out of Palestinian archaeology, but it's not easy. I, I think we have a lot to learn from trying to uh, correlate archaeological discoveries with those biblical texts that do have some quasi-historical character. Uh, much of the Hebrew Bible is not of much use to us, but let's say the books of King uh, Joshua Judges, Samuel, and Kings can be read as a history of some sort. So um, I'm simply trying to be an honest scholar, but the revisionists by and large have decided already beforehand that there's nothing historical about the Bible, so they've written it off. I think that's going much too far. Well, recently um, there's been a lot of controversy about uh, the, the historicity of King David. Yes. Um, what, what do you have to say about that? Well, David's a hard test case. Um, we don't have, admittedly, much archaeological evidence. Uh, but for Solomon, I would say we have a good deal of evidence. And yet the revisionists think that Solomon was not a historical figure at all. There was never any such person. They think there was no early state, no united monarchy, that the biblical account is altogether idealistic. I don't think so. I think we have evidence, archaeological evidence, of centralization, centralized planning of monumental structures at major administrative centers. And to me, this suggests state and, and kingship. Uh, and, and I would say, I guess, that if Solomon had not existed, we would have to invent another king with a different name and similar character. Well, it's my understanding that we've never found an extra-biblical inscription about Solomon. But we have, wasn't there one found not so yes. long ago about Da yes. The House of David? Uh, the name Solomon doesn't occur anywhere outside the Hebrew Bible, but then we wouldn't necessarily expect that it would. We don't have many texts of the 10th century, the period in which he would have lived. We do have a, a 9th century inscription from Tel Dan, where you worked in your youth, uh, in Israel, uh, written in Aramaic that describes a victory of the Arameans over the state of Israel, and the state is called the House or Dynasty of David. So uh, by about the mid-9th century, 100 years after David's time, we do have a reference to the dynasty of David in uh, a, a non-biblical text that provides an excellent witness. We also have the name of a king of Israel. So there must have been an Israel and there must have been a king. And in fact, though the text is broken, uh, the last letter of his name is M, which means it must be Jehoram or Joram, the only king by that name in the 9th century, uh, whose reign came to an end in 842. So we can date that inscription and we can say, if not in the 10th century, then in the 9th century we have firm, extra-biblical, historical, textual evidence. Well, what do the, the so-called biblical minimalists do uh, with that? Well, it's inconvenient for them. They've already decided that there cannot be an early Israel. So they've declared the inscription a forgery, planted on the venerable excavator of the site, Avram Behran, your friend and mine. This is, of course, rubbish. Uh, it is genuine and it means exactly what it says. What kind of scholarship is it that discredits all of the inconvenient evidence? Uh, this is the extent to which extremists will go to argue that there was no ancient Israel. And if you think perhaps there's an ideological agenda there, you're quite right. What would that uh, agenda be? 
Well, there are some people who, let's put it uh, gently, are not friends of Israel, ancient or modern. Um, some people who believe that archaeology can be used to settle complete, competing claims between Israelis and Palestinians today. I do not believe that. Um, and there are always people who, uh, who simply don't like the Bible um, and, uh, do, and, and enjoy Bible bashing. I don't think that's honest scholarship. Uh, one wants to read the Bible critically. Um, and when its stories are fanciful, we, we probably need to dismiss them. But there may be a core history, as I would call it. Uh, in other words, these are stories about the Iron Age of ancient Canaan. But behind the stories, there has to be some kind of reality. Ancient historians didn't just make it up out of whole cloth. Well, uh, you've often talked about the Bible as being like an artifact that was carefully yeah, exactly. curated. Exactly. What, what do you mean by that? Well, by saying the Bible is an artifact, we mean that even if you believe it to be in some sense the Word of God or to contain the Word of God, it is nevertheless a human product, something that people made with some idea of what they were doing. And then uh, an artifact may be handed down over many generations and reused for different purposes. Certainly the Bible has been handed down through many generations and has been transformed many times by later interpretations. So it's kind of like a, you know, a treasured artifact that has this wonderful uh, patina. Um, and, and on the one hand you need to cherish it, on the other hand you need to try to read it critically. So. Um, the Bible is sometimes a problem. You're more of a prehistorian than I am, and, and you don't always have to deal with the biblical text, but I do. Sometimes I wish the Bible had never been written or had been a little clearer about things. This would help. Some names and dates, please. <laughs> well, what kind of, could you talk a little bit about your methodology? How do you link the archaeological record of the Iron Age to the text? What do you look for? I think the basic thing is to look at these two sources for history writing independently. You do not go into the trench, trowel in one hand and Bible in the other, seeking to prove anything about the Bible. You, you have read the Bible, you're aware of what it may say, but you put that aside. You, you, you do your archaeological work honestly and independently. You make the best interpretation of, you, of the data that you can. Then you go to the text, biblical text, other text, whatever you may have, um, and discarding the fanciful elements, trying to read critically and with some sophistication, you try to understand whether there's any history behind the history. Um, if these two sources for history writing happen to converge, then as an honest historian, you may be able to su suggest a sort of probable scenario. If they diverge, then you must question both of your sources of data. And the fact is that archaeology has sometimes supported our in our traditional interpretation of biblical text in a rather astonishing way, and at other times it's raised very severe problems. There are many biblical stories that we know now are not historical, and it's been archaeology that's provided the proof. There are other cases in which it appears that the biblical writers had good information and were writing reasonably trustworthy history. When they wanted to, they could write history. Often they don't wish to. They're, they're writing about something else. Um, another aspect of your research has dealt with the archaeology of religion. Yes. What can archaeology inform us about people's religion? Well, I think archaeology can deal with religious p practices rather well. You've done a lot of work in archaeology and cult. When we find cultic art artifacts, uh, we can gain some clue as to what people were doing in the name of religion. Trying to understand belief is much more difficult, of course. And without text, I think we wouldn't be in a very good position. So I, I try not to deal with ancient theology. I'm not very good at, at reading the minds of the ancients. Um, but I, I try to describe religious practices. And what we know now is that the Bible gives us a very idealistic portrait of Israelite religion. It was written by minority parties, uh, orthodox parties, who were describing what the religion of Israel ought to have been like had uh, they been in charge, but they weren't. Uh, the actual religion of ancient Israel, popular religion or folk religion or family religion, was very different. We know that in the Bible there's only one deity and he's very male. Uh, but in actual practice there were several deities and some of them were female. So uh, we now are able to draw a rather sharp distinction between the very idealistic late report in the Hebrew Bible, what we might call book religion, and the actual religious practices of the majority of people in ancient Israel. I think that's an important uh, way of viewing Israelite religion. We now see it in much more variety and vitality than we did a generation ago. And what do you look for in the archaeological record to Well, to the kinds of that? cult sites that you've excavated, and I have two cultic objects and artifacts. Um, uh, but beyond that, of course, you want to reconstruct a kind of larger society in which these religious practices made some sort of sense, whether they do to us any longer or not. 
It's very difficult, very speculative, and uh, I think we ought to be modest about our conclusions. Some of our colleagues believe that, w that without text we can say nothing about religious practices. Again, I would take a sort of moderate middle-of-the-road position. I think we can say something. Um, but um, archaeology of cult has been neglected, as you know very well. You've pioneered in that field. I've tried to do the same. Many archaeologists are scared to death of, of religion, uh, and particularly of challenging the religious establishment. This is especially true in Israel, and there's a lot of bad feeling between the archaeologist and the religious establishment. Um, so the archaeology of a cult can be very controversial, can be very disturbing to many people. What are some of those gods or goddesses that have come up in these so-called Israelite sites? Well, we, we have a lot of artifactual and some textual evidence uh, about the cult of Asherah, the great Canaanite mother goddess who survives into Israelite times. There are at least 40 references to her in the Hebrew Bible, but, but many of them are garbled uh, as though the writers didn't like her, and they didn't. They didn't approve of her either. Uh, but then why disapprove of her if she weren't around? Uh, why prohibit goddesses if, if there weren't goddesses? So we should have known already from the text of the Hebrew Bible that there were other versions of Israelite religion. And in some circles, Yahweh, the national god of Israel, had a lady friend, had a consort. So I think Yahweh and Asherah were paired uh, as a couple, fertility deities, in the minds of many people, particularly in less educated circles or in rural areas. Uh, and I think we have very good evidence. Fifteen years ago, it was heretical to suggest that the God of Israel might have had a consort. Today, it's sort of conventional wisdom. Hmm. What, what's happening in Israel today with uh, young Israeli archaeologists? How are they uh, dealing with these controversies? Uh, they can't afford to be too controversial. Um, uh, as you know very well from living a long time in Israel, uh, it's a small country, everybody knows everybody else. Uh, these can become family quarrels and very bitter. There aren't very many jobs in Israel, and a young, young person has to be very careful of being involved in too much controversy early on. Uh, in general, the, the archaeological discoveries that have had to do with Israelite religion have been sort of suppressed. Uh, they, uh, but recently, they have begun to break out. There was a story in November in the Israeli papers that uh, uh, archaeology had shown that the ancient Israelites were not monotheists after all. Ah, a huge controversy broke out over that. People were really quite disturbed. Who do you think uh, is setting the agenda today for Near Eastern archaeology? I'm not sure there is any agenda beyond surviving. <laughs> and most of us who are not members of the national schools in the Middle East will do well to survive. I think for most young people, it's a matter of, uh, of finding a job and attaining some security and raising funds for field work. Um, Americans are having a very difficult time doing archaeology in the Middle East. Many countries are closed to us altogether and will be throughout our lifetimes. Uh, Israel happily is open. Jordan is quite open. Cyprus is open. Wouldn't it be wonderful to excavate in Lebanon or Syria, but we're hardly able to do so. Forget about Iraq and Iran. Egypt is also difficult. So um, increasingly the national schools are coming to dominate the archaeology of this region, and perhaps that's an inevitable development, but it's still a little sad. You mean the local? Yes, yes. Locals. It's still a little sad. This is sort of a game that we invented, and we've been reduced to being spectators in many cases. Hmm. What's, your, um, what's your take on, on how local p scholars in these Middle Eastern countries are using archaeology for nationalist purposes? We've tried so hard to avoid that, both in Israel and Jordan, and been successful until recently. Uh, most Israeli archaeologists are not politically active, though they have their own strong views. The same thing is true in Jordan. Uh, but increasingly, um, archaeology in both countries is, is uh, becoming um, the victim of nationalist tendencies. For instance, archaeology is now being used by both some Israelis and some Jordanians to, to argue who was there first and therefore has exclusive rights to the land. This is a great shame. You mean it's with a the perversion. Palestinians? Yes, or? both the Israelis and Palestinians mm -hmm. have, have been tempted to use archaeology to justify their own claims. Uh, I think that's a perversion of archaeology. Uh, I really bitterly resent that, but it, it may be inevitable. There was a time when uh, archaeology in Israel was characterized by people digging Iron Age sites, because that was yes. uh, so-called, right. is it was right. connected with the Israelites. What about the Palestinians today? What kind of archaeology are they doing? Uh, in the West Bank, they're increasingly digging Bronze Age sites, because they believe they can connect themselves with the Canaanite population that originally inhabited that area. 
uh, that's a suspicious kind of archaeology. They're avoiding Iron Age sites because they feel these will probably turn out to be Israelite sites. Oddly enough, they're not very interested in Islamic sites. You would think that they would be. That's a recent development, though. Um, most Jordanian archaeologists, I think, have avoided that trap rather well, and the Israelis have been really very good about it. I think there's been much more excavation of non-Israelite sites in Israel than Israelite sites. It's sort of ironic that uh, after the Six-Day War, the well, I don't know if it's ironic, but it's a fact that the archaeology of the Holy Land was certainly dominated by the Israelis, and I'm told that a major publication concerning archaeological surveys in the West Bank came out. How did the Israeli archaeologists deal with important periods like the Islamic period? I've recently reviewed that report of the surveys in the West Bank, and interestingly enough, the Islamic period gets more attention than any other period. So one could hardly accuse the Israelis of being biased in, a, in favor of ancient Israelite sites. On the contrary, I think there was a straightforward archaeological survey using the kind of methods that it would, would have been used anywhere in the world. I think the charge that they were biased is absolutely false. What would you, how would you characterize the most important discoveries concerning the biblical period? What, what, what are some of the, the, the benchmarks? Well, the origins of Israel has been one of the biggest topics in recent years, and I think we can now say that, that most models are indigenous models. Most Israelites had not come out of Egypt as slaves or anything of the like, or invaded the land in the great uh, military conquest. Um, we, our, our view of early Israelite origins has changed dramatically in the last 10 to 15 years. We've talked about cult earlier. The archaeology of cult has blossomed. Um, the whole question of when the, uh, Israel and Judah became states uh, is perhaps the hottest issue at the moment. Uh, but of course there are many, many other issues in Israeli archaeology that have nothing whatsoever to do with the Bible but, but are very important and very exciting. Uh, what we might call biblical archaeology I still think is a relatively small part of archaeology in Israel and an even smaller part of archaeology in Jordan, of course. What do you think are the uh the best way to, to make this field popular and known to uh, the American community uh, through television or well, magazines? Well, we, we ought to be more skillful at, at uh, promoting ourselves and the work we've been doing. Most of us think of scientific reports and don't do enough good popularization, so we leave it to people who do it badly. Uh, I think it's very important to, to promote the discipline in every way we can. For me, the question really is, is who owns the past? And, and, and what is the best use to make of the past? And I may be naive, but I think that probably the study of the past is, the remote past is the only way we ever really learn anything about ourselves and where we may be going. And for me, it's terribly important, too important, not to continue to have a major place in American universities, but we need to get the American public more interested in archaeology in the Middle East and more supportive above all. We need to create positions for the next generation of young people or our discipline will die despite popular support. Well, we have uh, a, 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 a fairly vibrant American professional organization, uh, ASOR, and they have a popular journal. Yes. It used to be called Biblical Archaeology. Now it's Near Eastern Archaeology. W what, what is that? They changed the name from Biblical Archaeology to a kind of amorphic, uh, well, Near Eastern archaeology. I guess the idea is to avoid the notion that biblical archaeology is an amateurish affair and, and of course biased by its interest in the Bible. I think the change was probably a mistake. Um, in some places though good things are happening. Your position is a fairly recent one here. You have a second position in archaeology. You may be creating a third. So this university is, is a, a, an unusually bright example of of how a program can be built up, a new program including a graduate program. But most universities are closing programs in archaeology rather than opening new ones. So you here are to be congratulated on being very forward-looking. But there are not enough universities like this one committed to this particular field. Well, you're in San Diego this weekend as a guest of the Biblical Archaeology right. Society which has their own journal, yes. uh, Biblical Archaeology uh, Archeo Archeo Review. Yeah, Review. I always get <laughs> the, the other, the other, the other one. And yet, I believe they have a, 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 about 250,000 readers. Do. They do. Are they setting the agenda for, for archaeology? <laughs> I hope not. No, we must set the agenda, but we need their support. It's, you know, it's really odd. You can go out and give a lecture on archaeology, and 500 people will come. What we really need is for five people to get out their checkbooks and endow a position for a young scholar. The popular support is wonderful. It's exhilarating. I'll have a wonderful audience here. 
But this doesn't translate into university positions or research funds or all the things we need. Popular interest is great, but it's not enough to sustain an academic discipline. And we can't look to government for support any longer. Um, we are on our own, for better or worse, now, and we must find new friends for our kind of archaeology. Well, we have a few more minutes. I, I was wondering if you could tell us a little something about your latest book that's coming out uh, in a uh, few months. Well, not to get a plug in for my book, but the title is uh, What Did the Biblical Writers Know and When Did They Know It? Archaeology and the Reality of Ancient Israel. It'll be out in the fall. It's my answer to the revisionist. Uh, the biblical writers knew a lot, and they knew it early. And the stories they tell may be stories, but behind them there lies a real history of a real people in a real time and place. There was an ancient Israel, uh, and it's up to us to recover it uh, and to learn what we can from its experience. Well, thank you very much, Bill. It's been my pleasure. And thank you all for joining us this evening.